Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome to this morning's uh, HO Colloquium. Uh, today we are very happy to have Dr. Uh, Xing Meng here to give us uh, today's uh, uh, this morning's colloquium. Uh, first, I should make an announcement. In the next few days, uh, we'll have our tea and actually a special C cubed after the seminar outside here. Uh, so, so sorry, you have to be uh, thirsty for an hour <laughs> before you can drink. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so Xing is a postdoctoral uh, fellow uh, in uh, ionosphere and uh, atmosphere remote sensing group at uh, JPL uh, Caltech. Uh, she received her PhD in uh, atmosphere oceanic uh, space science department and science, uh, scientific computing from uh, University of Michigan in 2013. Uh, she specializes in computational modeling of the solar terrestrial environment, and uh, she was the main developer of the uh, anisotropic version of Bats R Us model at Michigan. It's a global MHD model that incorporates uh, proton temperature anisotropy, and is now the par uh, part of the space weather uh, modeling framework. Uh, she's currently developing the wave perturbation Gitten model for simulating uh, ionosphere disturbances induced by uh, Earth surface perturbations. And sh today she's going to share her experience in model development. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, so I'd like to share you with my modeling experience uh, for the terrestrial ionosphere driven from above and from below. So uh, those are my collaborators uh, listed here. Um, so the outline of my talk is first I'm going to uh, give you a short in, a brief introduction of the topic and then I'm going to um, divide my talk into two major parts. The first one I'm going to uh, present you some modeling results uh, from, the, from the space weather perspective and the second one is to, um, um, some, it's to share with you some modeling results for the uh, driven from below with the by the acoustic and the gravity waves in the lower atmosphere. And uh, in the end, I'm going to uh, do some conclusions here. So first introduction part. Um, since I suppose not everyone has a ionosphere background, so I decided to put a, a general introduction of the terrestrial ionosphere uh, f first. At, uh, initially here. So uh, as you may already know that the ionosphere is um, it's not a, a strictly a, a, like a layer in the, ionos uh, in the atmosphere, but it's just a, a part where the charged particles are important in determining the, uh, the chemical and the physics properties of the atmosphere. So uh, if you look at the uh, profiles of the electron density, vertical profiles, it's actually divides the ionosphere into um, different layers. Um, so also the ionosphere have a different uh, variation uh, between day and night. So at day side, uh, uh, at night side, we, we have only uh, two layers and the night side, if it's uh, solar maximum, we have uh, e D region, E region, F1 and F2 layers. And then if it's a solar, close to a solar minimum, we only have a one single F layer peak. Um, okay, so um, total electron contact is referring to the electron column number density represented uh, by a unit TC unit. So this is um, uh, 10 to the 16th uh, per square meter. Um, and TEC is a direct indicator of the ionosphere state. Um, in, my, in the following of my talk, I'm going to show you a bunch of global maps of the ionosphere TEC. So those global maps of ionosphere TEC were produced, are produced by data connected from a continuously operating global network of GPS receivers. So here is a, the figure shows you an example of a real-time TEC map produced at JPL. Um, what we have here is a long, uh, global map uh, longitude and latitude no, uh, in geographic coordinates, and the color uh, the color scale representing the TEC in tech units. 
um, and you can see this equatorial uh, anomaly um, at the day side of the ionosphere, and then the night side of the ionosphere, we don't have much um, uh, TEC. Um, so this TEC is specifically derived based on the time delay of the GPS radio signals through the ionosphere. And it's essentially an integral from along the receiver and the satellite line of sight. So another uh, background I like to present here is the global ionosphere thermosphere model. So I'm going to use those models to, for the rest of my talk. So the simulations are from those models. So this model is uh, uh, basically solves for um, uh, fluid dynamic equations of um, the, uh, for the atmosphere and ionosphere. It has uh, different neutral and iron species, and it includes most of the physical processes that are important in the upper at atmosphere, such as the solar EUV heating, um, particle precipitation in the aurora region, and uh, chemical reactions and different uh, particle co collisions and viscosity, and also radiative cooling and uh, high lateral electric field. So um, most, uh, some of you might be familiar with the uh, Thai DCM model, a uh, very different uh, aspect in the GATE model versus the Thai DCM model is that the uh, GATE model allows for long hydrostatic uh, solutions, while the Thai DCM model is based on the assumption that the, uh, it's based on the hydrostatic uh, uh, assumption, which basically means that the pressure gradient in the vertical direction is always balanced by the gravity. Uh, gravity. Um, so the computational grid um, of the uh, global ionosphere and thermosphere model is based on geographic longitude, latitude, and altitude. So this is also a difference from the Thai DCM model, which is based on a uh, pressure level in vertical direction. And uh, uh, we have a very flexible co computational domain and grid resolution, which makes us uh, uh, which, which makes the simulation very flexible in terms of well, like region of interest we can specify, um, and also uh, in terms of different applications we can change the uh, grid resolution. Um, so the initial and boundary conditions are obtained from empirical atmospheric models, which includes uh, MCs, um, which provides a neutral a neutral density and temperature background uh, in the uh, lower atmosphere and also in the atmos neutral atmosphere and also horizontal wind model which provides you the wind uh, uh, state. Okay, so going to my first uh, uh, part of fir the first part of my talk, I like to present to you some space weather uh, simulations using the global ionosphere and the thermosphere model. So the motivation behind this study is that the solar disturbances can cause um, geomagnetic activity and ionospheric storms, which can affect technological systems. And this raises the question that whether it is feasible or it's possible that we can do some long-term operational ionosphere space weather forecasting. Um, so there are um, a number of uh, models of the ionosphere uh, and at uh, present, and uh, they offer opportunities of ionosphere forecasting. Um, we have data assimilative models. They are good for now cast and near term forecast. And in terms of uh, a long term, long term ionosphere forecast with lead time of a few days, we we will need fully physics based models. So the. Given the current uh, development of the physics-based global scale ionosphere models, um, they were adequately advanced to permit an uh, analysis of ionosphere forecasting. Um, so our focus will be predictions of TECs during CIR and high speed stream events using the GITA model. And the TEC forecasts are validated through global ionosphere maps, which I just show um, based that is obtained from the GPS data. So our objective is to understand the model behaviors and improve future ionosphere forecasts. 
So here's a list of CIR high-speed string events that I've selected during a period of um, a time period of 2006 to 2013. So which are listed on the left of the slide, and on the right uh, we have a uh, we have the solar wind drivers basically from the one minute omni data at one AU, and it's it shows you uh, four events. Which color also color coded by the on the left. The black one represents the 2007, and then we have the blue, green, and orange curves representing three other different events. So I like to uh, point out, uh, draw your attention that those different events, uh, the time series of different events, are time shifted such that the timing of their CIR are matching with each other, as shown in the first column in terms of the uh, solar wind speed increase. Um, so and also the CIR is um, a characteristic by an increase of the in the temperature and decrease in the density and also a strength a enhancement in the IMF intensity. Um, okay, so those events I'm only show you four of them. Uh, at this on this line now, but the rest of them are also similar in terms of solar wind drivers. So that provides a basis of our study here. Um, so we're going to use a GITAM model and GIM data to do our study. So we make a TEC forecast with GITAM. So the GITAM simulations are uh, driven by only F10.7 flux and the solar wind conditions. So we call it a TEC, uh, call it a, a forecast because both two indices or variables are considered to be forecastable. So F10.7 flux is predictable, and the solar wind conditions we can actually predict it from or forecast it from a physics based. Uh, solar wind models like COHO, NL, and SWMF. So our solar wind conditions actually are from both OMINI data and the three heliospheric and uh, uh, corona and heliospheric model predictions. Um, so the GIM maps, global ionosphere uh, maps, provide GPS-derived TEC data. So on the bottom of the slide, you show two uh, TEC maps. Those are hourly TEC maps from Gaten on the left and from GIM on the right. Again, it's based on geo uh, geographic coordinate system. And this is specifically for a, uh, for a time, 12 UT on one of the event days. Um, as you can see that the um, the the, the model, the GITA model actually captures the day size TEC increase um, uh, pretty well, but we have a, a, a significant underestimation in terms of TEC magnitude. So I want to re remind you that the GITA TEC is integrated electron density between 100 kilometer and 600 kilometer altitude. Those are the altitude limit by in the GITAM model. So presumably, we were missing a, uh, some portion of the electron density uh, above and below this model restricted altitude. So that could be one of the reasons that the simulated uh, TEC is smaller than the uh, GPS data. So we're going to do a TEC metric study. Um, so we, we were doing this study in several steps. So step one, we divide the globe into um, a grid boxes of uh, uh, equal size, so 30 degrees in longitude and 50 degrees, 15 degrees in latitude. So here uh, on the bottom, you see how we divide the grid box uh, for the TEC metric study. Um, OK, so we're going to compute the mean TEC within each grid box from both simulation and from the uh, GIM data. So step three, for each day, we define and calculate the TEC perturbation as, this, uh, as bounded by the red boxes here. So for GIM, we were doing a, we defined the TEC perturbation as the TEC perturbation, uh, as the TEC difference between the any given day uh, 
and a quiet time period, which based on several quiet day average, divided by the standard deviation of the quiet time period, TC. So for GIM, uh, for Gitten simulation, we define TEC perturbation as, again, the, the, t the TEC difference between any given day or given time and lo longitude and latitude degree uh, versus, uh, versus the, the Gitten quiet time this TEC difference, TEC, and divided by the GIM quiet time standard deviation and plus and multiply by a scale. So the reason we want to keep, we keep the denominator the same because we found that in the model simulation, the uh, standard deviation or quiet time variations um, in terms of TEC are much smaller than what it's present in the GIM data. So we want to make sure that they were using the same denominator so we are not uh, amplify the TC disturbances uh, because of the quiet time variation is small. And then we multiply by a scale um, UT here. Uh, scale UT here, which is defined by the the medium value of the uh, given TC uh, from GIM uh, quiet time versus uh, divided by the medium value of the uh, G Gitten quiet time TC at any given UT. So the quiet day are uh, quiet days. We have several quiet days um, for each. Uh, storm event, we select those based on the criterion that the uh, daily AP index is smaller than six. Um, so this TEC metric was calculated for all events and every grid box and every day. So we have a bunch of uh, statistical data here. And our final output is hourly TEC disturbances for every grid box. Um, so this one shows you um, a forecast product from uh, Omini driven, so again, so this is solar wind data driven Gitton simulation for TEC for one of the events, the April 2011 event. So you see a time sequences before the storm, initial phase, main phase, and recovery phase from left to right and from top to bottom. So different colors represent in the boxes re represented the different um, magnitude of the TEC disturbances we define. So you can, as you can see, uh, with our technique, you can clearly see that the TEC, uh, that the ionosphere is pretty quiet, which represented by green before the storm, and starting from the initial phase uh, on the top left, uh, the top right. Uh, panel, you're starting to see some TC disturbance on the southern hemisphere, uh, high latitudinal region, and then st in the storm main phase, we see a lot of variations over all latitudinal region, and then st storm recovery phase, most of the disturbances are fo are concentrating the uh, middle to low latitude region, and this actually agrees well with observations. Um, so this one is a TEC metric study example. In, in this uh, sense, we were looking at a particular, uh, a few particular longitude and, and latitude grid box for uh, one of the event. So we were looking at longitude 90, 90 to 120 east uh, in longitude, and we were looking at uh, northern hemisphere grid boxes. So we have six grid boxes, each or uh, the time series of the DTC, which represent the TEC perturbation, are uh, plotted on the left here. So the first day, when you don't see much perturbation and DTC equal to zero is a quiet day that we found for this event. And starting once we get into the storm date, we, you see a lot of oscillations here. So the um, so I like to point out that you see uh, several different colors, colored uh, lines here. So the black line represent the GIM data, and the blue uh, and the red represent the omni driven Gitten simulation, and uh, the blue one represent NL driven Gitten simulation. Green represent for coho uh, Gitten simulation, and the yellow represent SWMF driven Gitten simulation. So. Um, so but essentially, the black one is the data, 
that we were comparing the models to, and the, and the red one is a data-driven model simulation, and all the rest are model-driven model simulation, which means the solar wind is also from a model prediction. So um, we were looking at, uh, uh, we were trying to find a way to quantify this, all kinds of uh, different variations as you see on this left uh, plot here. So that turns out that we can do an average metric for a given, uh, uh, for a given absolute DTC value when once it reaches, reaches or larger than four, we were plotting a bunch of uh, uh, perturbations here. So what we have here that you see a lot of uh, small rectangulars. So the width of the rectangular represents the, the time duration uh, of when the DTC the absolute value of DTC exceeds four and the height of this different rectangulars represent the average TC, DTC disturbances over this time period. So by doing this, we, uh, we were having this average metric uh, plot, which gave us an uh, indication of how long and how much the TEC disturbances exist at a certain level. Um, OK, so this one. Uh, gives you a statistical uh, uh, a table for all events and uh, uh, all grid boxes. So all, again, different color represent for different uh, simulations here. And the GIM represented by black is the data. So you see, we count for how many disturbances we have, like how many rectangulars we have for each event. Then we uh, we have some statistical results here. So like for, for one of the event, we have found like s over 700 GIM disturbances. But however, in the simulations, we found less, much less, uh, much less uh, disturbances here. Uh, so we were doing a, 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 a strictly a plus and minus three, three hours um, time constraint here, because once you uh, because we we allow for a time delay or um, for the uh, simulated TEC disturbances here. So basically, once we see a TEC disturbance in GIM data in plus and minus three hours, as uh, as long as we see a, a, a TEC disturbance in the simulation, we call it a forecast success. So here. I'm defining a forecast success rate as the GIM TC disturbances, the number of disturbances, divided by the number of GIM DC disturbances here. So here on the right, this figure shows you the forecast uh, performance uh, plot. So the, again, the red represents the omni driven uh, Gittin simulation, and the rest are um, solar wind model driven Gittin simulation. And different uh, uh, dots here represent for different events. Um, as you can see, that for omni driven Gittin simulation, we were basically having about uh, 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 between 0.3 and 0.4 success rate, which means that about one third of the t uh, observed TEC disturbances were correctly captured by the simulations. And uh, all the rest, which driven by the solar wind simulation, has less than about a 20% success rate. So the error is apparently due to the, um, uh, the solar wind drivers, because we were, by applying the solar wind models, we were might not be able to capture all the variations in the solar wind. OK, so um, once we have those statistical results, um, our job is not uh, done yet, because we want to uh, ask, un ask a few questions. Um, we, saw, we do see some uh, forecast success, but are those forecast success due to correct physics? And also in the simulation, we do see sometimes when GIM predicts us TEC perturbation, but the GI, the Gitten simulation does not have any perturbations. So, uh, and also vice versa. So we want to ask what might cause the forecast misses and false alarms. So here on the bottom of this uh, slide, I'm showing you an example that we were been doing right now. We want to identify contributors to electron density change, which 
eventually contribute to TEC in, uh, in individual grid boxes. So there are two major contributors, at least in the simulation, in the model simulation. One is transport, and another is chemical production and loss that could uh, change uh, electron density uh, within a grid cell. So here I'm showing you just uh, two examples of grid box studies. So those are two neighboring grid box in uh, east and westward direction. And they have very different electron density changes over the time. So the horizontal axis represent the time in UT on, on, any, on the given storm day. And then the vertical axis represent uh, for electron density uh, in, within grid cell. And different colors represent for different local time. So on grid box one, we have this uh, increase and then decrease. And grid box two, we have this consistently increase. Um, so and then we look into the different uh, uh, contributions from transport and chemical production loss. We can see that um, so the light um, red line represent for transport term contribution, and the, uh, the gray line represent for chemical contribution. As we can see that the, in the first grid box, we have some equally contribution from both chemical reaction and also transport. While on the second grid box, the increase of the electron density with during this time period are mostly contributed by transport. So the, um, the following two panels are just I'm breaking down transport into different directions, like the eastward, northward, and, uh, and also vertical direction. And also chemical reactions, I am identify a few major contributions that can contribute, to produ that can produce or lo and lose electrons. So OK, so the summary for this part of my talk is that we performed a forecast-orientated ionosphere modeling with a fully physics-based model. And we proposed a DEC metric, which can be potentially used as a product for operational weather forecasting. We evaluate uh, forecast performance with GPS measurements. And lastly, but not uh, and, and most importantly, we need to understand what models can do and what models cannot do. And, by, and in order to do that, we, uh, we will analyze the physics behind the simulations. So um, a, f a possible next step for the study is that we can also assess the uh, feasibility of forecasting CME-driven ionosphere storms, which is a completely different type of storms uh, than high-speed stream-driven um, ionospheric uh, uh, perturbations. So um, going to the uh, next topic of my talk, which I'm going to show you some example of how I couple the lower atmosphere or the surface disturb the disturbances with the lower atmosphere and the ionosphere through acoustic and gravity waves. So um, I'm giving you a few background here. Um, so the Earth's surface disturbances um, I'm talking about earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanic eruptions here. Those can all generate atmospheric waves as long as the magnitude is large enough. And then uh, those waves can propagate upward, inducing TEC perturbations in ionosphere. So the physics behind this is that once you have a ground disturbances at the ocean, uh, Earth's surface, either ground surface or ocean surface. It can perturb the neutral atmosphere just above the surface. And that perturbation causes atmospheric uh, acoustic and the gravity waves. And because the neutral density are decreasing exponentially with height, to conserve at most of the energy, the wave amplitude has to increase with height. So which means a small perturbation, maybe just a, centimeter, a few centimeter at the ground of the Earth's surface can generate a TEC perturbation that can be ob actually observed in the ionosphere. So there have been uh, a few, uh, a lot of uh, observational studies using GPS data uh, to, again, so those plots show to you the GPS-derived vertical TEC perturbations during the 2000, March 2011 Tohoku Oki earthquake and tsunami event. So those are just showing you time sequences and time and uh, the um, the white blue.
con uh, color contour shows you the tsunami wave height, and the red blue color contour shows you the observed TEC disturbances. So you can see that those TEC dis disturbances expand from the epicenter nicely and with about the same speed as the tsunami as the tsunami propagate into the ocean. So. Um, so by monitoring the ionosphere, we could also possibly detect and track surface disturbances that are otherwise difficult to identify. For example, tsunamis. You might know that tsunamis, even though it's very, um, it had very huge wave height once it approached the coastline, but in the open ocean, when it's still uh, maybe a few thousand uh, kilometers away from the coastline, the ocean's surface disturbance is only a few centimeters, which makes it's very difficult to detect in instantly, uh, to detect at the ocean surface. So with the GPS observational technique, what we can do is that if we observe the, if we receive the, uh, if we derive the TEC disturbances for along the GPS uh, satellite, receiver to satellite line of sight, as you can see in from this animation here, once the ionosphere disturbances come across that line of sight, you can possibly observe that feature. But by that time, the tsunami on the ocean surface has not arrived to the coastline yet. So this provides us a possibility to detect um, tsunamis. And also you can see there are two satellites here, Grace, Grace A and Grace B. So those are space-based observations which can also do this type of uh, uh, measurement here. Um, so the motivation of the study is that we want to model this ionosphere signatures and try to understand observations and reproduce the wave pr propagation process from the Earth's surface into the ionosphere. So there are a couple of different models that have been developed up to date, but they either rely on empirical atmosphere or ion an ionosphere background or they neglect some important physical processes in the upper atmosphere. So our objective here, we want to develop a time-dependent three-dimensional and physics-based model to better capture the ionosphere, ionosphere signatures induced by surface disturbances. So here's a diagram of, of our model. We call it wave perturbation Gitta model. So as you can see, we were basically adding a lower atmosphere component to the, to the global ionosphere and thermosphere model here. So um, between 100 kilometer and 600 kilometer altitude, the model is represented by Gitta. Um, and then below 100 kilometer altitude, we were adding this coupling of wave perturbation model, which is essentially an analytical model, basically. So this particular model takes the surface perturbation characteristics as input. So in terms of tsunami, we're going to need to input the tsunami waveform um, and the tsunami wave uh, direction. And uh, the output of this model is the uh, ionosphere and thermosphere state. Uh, which means the density, velocity, and temperatures between 100 km and 600 km altitude for different neutral and iron species. And we can further validate our simulation output with ground-based, which basically GPS observation, and also space-based, like I just showed with the example of Grace A and Grace B constellation. Um, so uh, for now, we have uh, finished the development of tsunami-induced gravity waves, because tsunami has a very long uh, wavelength comparing to a seismic signal or earthquake. So this part is relatively easy to implement, because we were assuming that tsunami only induce gravity waves uh, instead of uh, a complicated uh, acoustic uh, gravity wave coupled uh, coupled together. And uh, I'm working right now on seismic acoustic gravity waves. 
Um, so here's a more detailed um, um, description of the model. So uh, be, uh, beyond 100 kilometer altitude re represented by Gaten, I'm not going to go to the details because I've already introduced the model, but I want to show you that there is one feature of Gaten that is particularly useful for this purpose. It's the flexible uh, computational domain and adaptive grid resolution. Because once you input a tsunami uh, or earthquake induced wave into the simulation, you have to make the grid cell uh, adaptive or small enough that can simulate small, smaller wavelengths or large wavelengths based on whatever your, your input is. So, and the wave perturbation model is, is essentially a analytic model. It propagates acoustic gravity waves from the ground to about 100 kilometer altitude in the neutral atmosphere. And then this was fed into the global ionosphere and the thermosphere model. So uh, the wave perturbation model is based on analytical solutions derived from polarization relations of the acoustic and, uh, and, uh, and gravity waves. Um, um, there are two types of ground perturbations. In terms of, in the case of tsunami, we were input the perturbation as a plane wave on the ocean surface. And in, in, earth, in the case of earthquake, it's a point source. So, um, and then there are, we were disturb, disturb all kinds of neutral quantities like, like neutral density, neutral wind in three directions and neutral temperature. Um, I'd like to add that we, for now, we were still still uh, rely on some a number of assumptions for this model, like we assume for um, isothermal atmosphere, and we assume no wave dissipation below 100 kilometer altitudes. Um, so in the next few slides, I'm going to show you two examples. One is for a tsunami event, another is for earthquake event. So those are our simulation results. Um, so first of all, uh, you might remember that back in 2011, there was a huge earthquake in Japan. Um, those earthquakes generated tsunami waves propagating um, across all the way across the Pacific Ocean and reached the US West Coast. So that's going to be our simulation region as you can see on the right side of the slide. So we were looking at a small region of about 20 degree by 20 degree size and uh, focused on the US West Coast. And we were looking at a, a six hour time period when the, when the tsunami arrived. Um, the grid resolution here we were using is about 0.2 degrees. So that corresponding to about a, a 20 kilometer um, lens, which is pretty good for a tsunami wave simulation because a typical tsunami wave has a period, and also it's generated a gravity wave waves has a period of, as a wavelength about a few hundred kilometer um, uh, in length. So uh, we obtain the tsunami information from a model, which uh, which is the ocean model uh, that is used to simulate uh, tsunamis. And we consider only the most significant waves when the wave height reach nine cent uh, eight centimeter uh, in the open ocean. So we were, by doing this, we identify three major waves, wave A, B, and C, as you can see on this figure here. So this shows you at a particular time snapshot that when the waves, the first leading two, two leading waves uh, is touching the uh, US West coastline and there is a still another major waves uh, behind, which gonna arrive in a few hours. So. We did two simulations with and without tsunami waves. And by doing that, we did, we did a subtraction between the two simulations and that gave us the ionosphere perturbations due to the tsunami itself. So here is an analytical model solution for the neutral atmosphere perturbations uh, during this event. Um, as you can see, we, I'm showing you the neutral density, east wind, north wind, and upward wind, and also neutral temperature in different panels. Uh, again, we were looking at longitude and, log and, and latitudinal plane, and you see the coastline uh, uh, represented by the black line here, and uh, you see the, the waves are propagating inward into the coast, uh, into the U.S. Uh, continent here. Even though the tsunami waves 
essentially it's stopped at the coastline. It's generated a wave structure actually propagate much, much more further inland. Um, so this one shows you the TEC perturbations from this event. Again, you can see two signature, uh, two major group of waves induced by the three major tsunami waves that I identified f uh, in future. And the T and the TEC perturbations in terms of magnitude, magnitude can reach about 0.8 TEC unit which is actually very significant here, given that uh, a nominal ionosphere uh, absolute TEC would be like uh, uh, 80, uh, 70 or 80. This corresponds to about 5% of perturbations. So um, this, uh, for uh, this event, we did some comparison with GPS observed TEC perturbations. So before I go into the details of the comparison, I'd like to introduce the concept of ionosphere pierce point, which is the intersection of the uh, GPS to receiver line of sight with the F region peak or, or assumed F region peak. So normally uh, for this GPS um, observational study, we assume that the F region peak is located at about uh, 300 kilometer or s between 300 and 400 kilometer altitude, depending on the local time and the, uh, and the region. So. Um, Basically, we were, uh, for each of the receiver and satellite pair, we're going to have a time series of those, uh, along those IPP points of the TEC, for the TEC perturbations. So on the bottom left two figures, you see uh, two different snapshots how those uh, IPP trajectories are uh, local, are, lo are located in the uh, simulation re uh, regime here. And the right, uh, the red asterisk represents the uh, the location of the IPP point at a given time here. So basically, most of IPP points moves inland, um, as you can see here. And we have we have identified about uh, 18 uh, different satellite to receiver GPS receiver uh, pairs. So I'm showing you uh, f uh, six of them uh, for the, the GPS uh, comparison, uh, observational comparisons. So the y, uh, the blue lines represent for simulation, uh, simulated TEC perturbation in terms of TEC units, and the black line represent for GPS derived TEC perturbations. And those again is a time series about uh, five hours. Um, so, um, and each panel represents for a different satellite to receiver pair. So you can see that in some of the uh, uh, cases, we have very good uh, com comparison between uh, simulation and data in terms of the, GP, uh, the, the TEC um, perturbation arrival time and also the magnitude like uh, in the middle two uh, panels here. And also there are some cases like uh, uh, in the uh, three and uh, four here, uh, we don't have much, we don't see much perturbation or um, the perturbation is not easy to identify. This is also because that it, due to the orientation of the GPS, of the IPP trajectory, if it is nearly parallel to the wave propagation <coughs> direction, it might miss, it, 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 it are, they will not be able, they are not able to capture the, the wave peaks and the wave dips. So as you can see that our simulation actually captures this or this whenever if there is a perturbation or not, they were both doing well here. So another uh, event simulation here is the recent 2015 Chile earthquake event. So here we were looking at a small region again uh, around the epicenter of the Chile earthquake last year. So we were doing a very fine grid resolution. It's about 10 times finer grid than the tsunami case because we were dealing with a much smaller wavelength here. Um, so the temporal resolution is about one second. Here is a, our idealized simulation input. So we were assuming th those are sine waves generated right at the epicenter after the main shock. So again, we were comparing two simulations with and without seismic waves. And by uh, subtract uh, the tsunami, 
subtract between those two simulations, we got the difference between the, um, uh, we got the difference and that gave us the perturbations due to the earthquake. So here is the example of the uh, tsunami in, uh, uh, earthquake induced uh, neutral atmosphere perturbation at about 100 kilometer uh, altitude from our simulation. Again, this shows you only the neutral atmosphere perturbations, density, wind, and temperature. Uh, so you can see there is a um, red asteroid, red uh, mark here represent the epicenter, and you can see the waves uh, expand nicely from the epicenter as time goes. So here's a vertical, uh, a bunch of uh, snapshots taken every two minutes for neutral density perturbations in percentage on top and electron density perturbations in percentage at bottom. So those are specifically two dimensional cards which are taken at the epicenter latitude. So we were looking into the longitude and altitude uh, uh, plane here. As you can see that, we can clearly see the, uh, the wave generation and the propagating through uh, the neutral atmosphere and ionosphere um, upward. Um, also, I'd uh, like to point out that the, the, those atmosphere perturbations reach the ionosphere heights about 10 minutes after the beginning of the ground dis uh, displacement or beginning of the earthquake. So those are in good agreement with observations here. So as I may, uh, may recall you that we use a very idealized sine wave input to, repre to represent the ground dis displacement at the earthquake, uh, uh, for the earthquake. So what we can actually do as uh, what I'm doing working on right now is that I'm getting the, gr the actual uh, um, observed ground displacement at a, a GPS station nearby the epicenter, and you see all kinds of variations, which is much complex than a sine wave. And we extract a time period of interest, and uh, we did a Fourier transform and got uh, the power spectrum, and we can reconstruct the ground displacement uh, by taking the, f the first few or a couple of major components of the Fourier, comp uh, Fourier transformed results. So the eventually, this will become the input to our wave perturbation Gitten model. So the summary of this part that is that we, as you see, we have successfully developed a self-consistent physics-based model wave perturbation Gitten that simulates tsunami-caused upper atmosphere disturbance, and we were working on the earthquake-caused disturbance as well. So um, we have reproduced the GPS observed um, traveling ionosphere signatures of actual tsunami event, which is a Japan uh, tsunami event um, for the first time. Um, so uh, our next step is here. We have, we, uh, as I mentioned before, that our analytical model is based on a number of assumptions, which may not be applicable uh, to the actual um, lower atmosphere. We are going to refine the analytical model and trying to relax those assumptions. And we are going to uh, reconstruct the gr ground displacement for more realistic model inputs. So before I f get to the conclusion, I'd like to mention to you the big plan. Um, so uh, what, why we were developing this wave perturbation Gitten model? Because eventually, we, will, we do see a, 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 like an application in, in possible tsunami early warning system here. We can uh, develop an inversion algorithm when, it's becomes, when the model becomes mature enough that uh, by monitoring the ionosphere uh, and having the, those TEC perturbations data, we can invert to get the tsunami characteristics and the ocean surface, and we can raise alarms for for the major cities. And those can, we did an estimation that this can give us a approximate lead time about uh, one and a half an hour, which is pretty good. So another application to this wave perturbation Gitten model is that um, we were thinking of applying it to planetary seismology, like including the uh, remote sensing of Venus atmosphere and ionosphere. 
So my conclusion is, for the first time, we use a state-of-art model, Gitten, to perform a space weather forecast study of the ionosphere. And also, we modeled the tsunami earthquake ionosphere coupling self-consistently and reproduce the ionospheric signatures of actual tsunami event. So um, I, I did the, all this work with the help of global ionosphere and thermosphere model. So there are also a bunch of other global ionosphere uh, models available. Those models are very useful and have a lot of potentials in studying all kinds of uh, problems. We hope to use this model, or I, I prefer to use those models well, such that we could, first of all, understand the physics uh, which is most important, and second or I want to actually push the model capabilities to their boundaries and explore everything that the model can do. And those could eventually lead to the way to model improvement. So I'm going to let you to read my acknowledgement here, and uh, thank you for your attention. It's a 3D model. there's many other sources of you know the weather systems and everything that are creating similar fluctuations do you think you'll be able to separate out the the tsunami signatures in the TEC from all of the other uh, signals you, you know it's all right if you know that you're looking for a particular one but if you're trying to detect that signal with all the other sources do you think you'll still be able to detect the tsunami out of all the the other noise at that same sort of amplitude Yes, so that is a very good point. So this is actually exactly the reason why we have developed this model. Because by looking at observations alone, we cannot identify what causes those TC perturbations. So that comes into the model. By using the model, we can control it. We can verify that this signature observed is indeed induced by tsunamis or earthquakes. Is there, well, is there an application for uh, this uh, procedure to uh, monitor underground nuclear testing? Uh, excuse me? Well. <laughs> so man-made earthquakes from Man nuclear tests? Yes, yes, absolutely. It can be applied to uh, like a, a explosions, nuclear explosions. So there are, there are observations, GPS observations, that actually can observe those kind of uh, uh, signals induced by um, uh, explosions at the ground or beneath the ground. So or I'm going to go before you because I got the mic. Woo <laughs> Um, I was intrigued with your, your simulations of the, the, the wave fronts that they, they propagated seemingly on a straight line past the, past the coast, but then at some point in time they sort of took a right turn and started to propagate there. What, what was the origin of that, of that change in direction of the, of the wave fronts? So that is due to reflections. So imagine you have a tsunami wave, actual tsunami wave, once it, and it induces um, uh, perturbations in the atmosphere. Once it reaches the coastline, the tsunami waves get reflected by the coastline. And meanwhile, it's generated uh, atmospheric uh, signatures or perturbations is also reflected by the coastline. But, but it's further inland. Yeah, it yes, seems but to be so much farther away from the Because it takes coastline. time for the tsunami waves, generated waves propagated from ground to the ionosphere height. So that represents the time difference takes to vertically propagation just the wave. And related to that, uh, you also saw actually a westward propagation. Uh, it, it, I can understand the reflection maybe you know reflect downward, but can still propagate eastward. But uh, in the in the movie you showed, there's uh, also a westward propagation. Y it, that is depends on the shape, the orientation of the coastline. 
So I'm not implementing a, a simple straight line to represent the coastline. Actually, I'm following the exact shape of the US West Coast. So at some high latitude, latitudinal part, I believe the wave is propagating uh, reflect westward. For your, for your stor uh, storm study, uh, if I understand the metric properly, you were comparing the numbers of fairly large disturbances or uh, departures from the average of the model and the observations. Yes. But it was without regard to location. In other words, it, it, do I understand this right, that if there was a large uh, disturbance in one region, it contributed toward the metric even if that region was misplaced, if, if the actual disturbance was in a different region? Um, actually, why we were doing those um, metric study, we did look into uh, uh, try to match the uh, exact local region and local time. So we were analyzing individual grid cells separately. So it's not like we see a perturbation here and uh, the actual observations see a perturbation there. That does not count for a success in our case. Yeah. So your um, prediction score is kind of low, you know, three, uh, most of them are between two to three, and you s look at the, uh, try to look at the physical magnets driving the, you know, density variation. So what is your next step to improve those prediction scales? It's still an uh, ongoing work. I haven't, uh, I haven't got any clue from the, uh, the grid cell analysis study. I just try to understand how how this works mechanistically for when you have a, a tsunami wave that propagates through the atmosphere it, it it must amplify a great deal as it goes yes. up and then it gets to the thermosphere and it's a neutral density perturbation right so how does that change the ionosphere and TEC uh, you mean the mechanism yeah yeah so what's the mechanism um so uh, the uh, initially the waves are propagating in the neutral atmosphere, um, and that perturbs the neutral particles. And once it reaches the ionosphere height, we have the neutral iron collisions, which closely couple the ions and neutrals <coughs> together. And the momentum from the neutrals are transferred to the ions, and that causes the TEC perturbations. So um, I saw your CIR-driven simulations of Gittin, and some of the cases, the omni skidden perturbation TEC are opposite to what you observe in many cases. Yes. Are those counted as um, failure or, I mean, in, in the metric? Those are, those are not counted as a success. Yeah, but yeah. then, do you ha have any idea why? Um, honestly, I don't have an idea, but we were looking into those, yeah. That's uh, the whole like uh, objective or goal of the, thank you. <laughs> so um, just follow up Dr. Ganglu's question. So I'm just curious about how much is the influence from the um, highlighted driving during storms on the TEC? Because you're using the uh, heliospheric models to do the pr predictions. And we know that those models might be doing a good job on the yes. The, the velocity or the direction, but not the orientation of the IM, IMF. So that limits the you know you know the pr forecasting ability. So my question is, how much does that affect on the TEC prediction? Um, in terms of TEC prediction, you already seen those um, um, forecast uh, uh, analysis that we have a much lower success rate in terms of the TEC predictions. Uh, you said they are using Hillis model to, uh, to specify the, okay, yeah, yeah, that's right, okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. No more questions. Uh, let's thank the speaker again. And don't forget, we'll have uh, C-cubed here and around. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much.